Thanks for joining us today for Jennifer Schaus and Associates in our DFARS Webinar Wednesday program, live from Washington, D.C. We are uncovering each part of the DFARS, or Defense Federal Acquisition Regulation Supplement, every Wednesday at 12 p.m. Eastern. As you know, the DFARS are the rule books for contracting with the Defense Department. We are moving sequentially, starting with DFARS Part 201 today and finishing with Part 253 in December. Our webinars are every Wednesday and are provided complimentary. They're recorded and can be downloaded from our website and YouTube channel, which now holds over 450 of our government contracting webinars. In the interest of time, we do not take questions, so if you have questions for our speaker, we will have his information on the last side of the presentation today. And a special thanks to our educational sponsor, the National Veterans Small Business Coalition, for making these webinars possible. The NBFCC is the largest nonprofit trade association for veterans. Please visit their website for more information. Okay, and now a little bit about us. We work with U.S. federal government contractors, including product, service, and software firms. Our services range from market analysis reports to contract vehicles and compliance. More information is on our website. We also have opportunities for your organization to advertise in our newsletter. We now reach over 23,000 subscribers, and this includes both contractors and government. Contact us for pricing information with the email shown on the screen. I also wanted to inform you of a new series this year in 2021. We have launched a monthly series called the GovCon Live Q&A Cafe. This is a live webinar series held each month. These will take place on the second Friday of each month in 2021 at 12 p.m. Eastern. We have assembled a group of four panelists who are subject matter experts on a specific federal contracting topic. The panelists will make a short presentation about the topics listed here on your screen, and then we'll take your live questions about that topic. So, for example, January will kick off with our panelists covering CMMC this Friday, January 8th, and next month in February, another panelist will cover OTAs. Our panelists include attorneys, consultants, and other industry professionals, and you can sign up on our website under the Q&A Cafe tab. Sponsorships are available, and please email hello at jennifershouse.com for a media kit with pricing details. And you can use code DFARS for a $15 discount um, to make the ticket only $20. Okay, and now to introduce our speaker, Terry O'Connor. Welcome, Terry, and we are glad to have you here with us today, and I'll now turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Hunter. Uh, welcome to our seminar. Uh, my name is Terry O'Connor. I'm the Director of Government Contracts and a partner with a law firm of Barron's Wide Leonard in Tyson's Corner, Virginia. And I'd like to just briefly give my background because my presentation today is based on what I've learned from the many years of working in government contracts. After law schools, I was a federal government attorney for almost 15 years and then went into uh, private practice, first as the director of operations for a small business that did a lot of business with DOD. And I then went into private practice with a uh, government uh, sole practitioner uh, in government contracts and later as a partner uh, in a firm. While I was in private practice, I also got involved in teaching contracting officers and contract specialists uh, associated with management concepts. And a lot of what I know about government contracting comes from my time as a government lawyer and my, my teaching experience with contracting officers. Can I have the next slide, please? I think it's important to begin by discussing the overall uh, FAR provisions in uh, FAR Part 1 the Federal Acquisition Regulations. First of all, before FAR, there was no government-wide system. Before 1984, when FAR was adopted, if you wanted to do business with DOD, you used something called the Armed Services Procurement Regulations, which dealt only with, obviously, the armed services. And this was true for every federal agency or department. Each agency had its own. But Congress realized that it would be easier for vendors to sell to the government if the vendors had one set of 
common set, if you will, that would describe how the agencies would buy stuff. So in the late 1970s and early 80s, the agencies began to develop a set of federal regulations that would apply across the board to all agencies, and that was FAR. But agencies obviously have specific needs that are different from other agencies, and these agencies require tweaks in the FAR. So FAR provided for the use of supplements. The weird result for DOD was, for example, that a, a vendor who wanted to sell only to the Defense Department used to have to have to go only one set of regulations to deal with the ASPR. As a result of the introduction of FAR in the mid-80s, DOD vendors now had to deal with several volumes of regulations. Uh, at least for them, it, it didn't seem like an awful lot of progress. In any event, there's now the Federal Acquisition Regulation System. This slide in front of you shows all the parts of FAR Part 1 that can be supplemented by our topic today, DFARS Part 201. It's really impossible, I think, to study a supplement without knowing the basic information the supplement is supplementing. So for this presentation, before I discuss any DFARS provision, I'm gonna just briefly discuss the FAR section of supplements. As you will see, not all these FAR subparts have been supplemented by DFARS. Uh, regardless of whether there's a DFARS provision, the FAR provision is something you want to know. So I will just briefly mention all the FAR provisions in FAR Part 1, whether or not they've been supplemented by DFARS to give you context to what the DFARS provisions are. I think a brief discussion of FAR Part 1 is important because FAR Part 1 is something people do not often get into. It doesn't get a lot of attention, and perhaps that's because FAR gets consulted usually when there's a problem to be solved. So typical searches through FAR have a very pragmatic aspect to them that, to solve a problem. As we will see, not much of FAR Part 1 gets down to the nitty gritty of, of problem solving. It's more at the 30,000 foot level of policy. It's important to realize, though, that FAR Part 1 is a number of very important provisions and some very important provisions you're going to want to know. But as a practical matter, FAR Part 1 is what I refer to as an orphan. It doesn't get much uh, exposure, and that's a shame, I think. The next slide talks about the various uh, regulations that we're going to be dealing with. And the purpose of FAR, I think, is pretty straightforward. Uniform policies and procedures for all the executive agencies, that's, that's pretty general. The purpose of DOD uh, acquisitions is a little more specific and very similar to uh, the objectives of acquisitions worldwide. Basically, getting quality supplies the users need at a fair and reasonable price. Notice that DOD includes the requirement for measurable improvements to mission capability, and that certainly makes sense for DOD. One interesting point, I think, in this particular uh, section is that DOD procurement should focus not only on the current U.S. armed forces, but on future armed forces. I read a book by Robert Gates, the former Secretary of Defense who served under Presidents Bush, Clinton, and Obama. In his book, I was struck by the fact that he believed that DOD at that time focused too much on future war needs and not enough uh, on the ongoing struggles across the world that the United States was involved in at that time. And so it's interesting that this purpose section was added in 2018. Can we have the next slide, please. This next FAR section does not have a corresponding DFAR section, but it's perhaps one of the most important provisions, I think, in FAR. This provision shows the preference, or bias, if you will, that FAR has for innovation. Notice that it says, in exercising initiative, the government may assume if a policy is in the government's interest and not addressed or prohibited by law, it's permissible. A great example of procurement's use of this provision is the introduction of a reverse auction. There's absolutely nothing in FAR or federal law that says whether reverse auctions are possible. And there's also nothing in federal law that prohibits 
reverse auctions. After agencies started using reverse auctions, some vendors fought them in court, GAO, and lost because the agencies had complied with this provision. We have the next slide, please. This FAR provision shows the three main components that control FAR. The Secretary of DOD, the head of GSA, and the Administrator of NASA. This group is commonly called the FAR Council. Next slide, please. This provision is a good example of one FAR provision requiring you to look at another part of FAR. In this case, FAR Part 2 definitions. As we'll see, acquisition in FAR Part 2 is very broadly defined and it's truly cradle to grave. Relevant here is that the part of the acquisition definition says acquisition involves appropriated funds. DFARS expands its applicability by saying that DFARS applies to foreign military sales and NATO projects without regard to the source of the funds obligated. We have the next slide, please. These provisions are very handy because they identify where you can find a copy of R and D FARs. Let me stress at this point that it's awfully important that you make sure that any time you consult FAR or DFARS, you're consulting the most recent version. I have a version of FAR and DFARS that are printed by CCH. It's about three inches thick and printed on very thin paper. But any time I go to FAR for a specific issue, I always go to the electronic version to make sure that I have the most up-to-date version possible. I found that using an outdated version of FAR or DFARS is one of those mistakes you only make once. But you really don't have to make it at all. Uh, next clause, uh, I'm sorry, slide please. The provisions on this slide describe the OMB control numbers that are related to various prior, various uh, FAR provisions. You don't need to worry about this slide. Notice also uh, the reference here to PGI, Procedures, Guidance, and Information. There's an awful lot of information in that. We'll get to that later. Next slide, please. This deals with certifications. The procurement process requires countries to make an awful lot of certifications. For example, they have to certify uh, whether they're a small business. These FAR and DFARS provisions show how effectively, as a practical matter, contractors have pushed back against all the provisions that require them to certify something associated with the procurement. And the concern here is that a, a false certification by a contractor can open up false claims litigation against the contractor. So contractors really don't like to have to make any kind of certification due to the penalties associated with them. Both provisions, therefore, prohibit agencies from imposing more certifications on a contractor. Unless the certifications is imposed by statute, Congress, right? or in the case of DOD, justification is given to the Secretary of DOD and the Undersecretary. Next slide, please. Buried in these introductory parts of FAR are two very important provisions that have very practical day-to-day -day, uh, application, and yet they're buried uh, when people should know what they say. The first one is dollar thresholds. It's an important concept, I think, because a lot of provisions of FAR deal with dollar amount thresholds. Uh, the classic example is a one-year base contract plus four option year contract. What's the total value of that contract? Well, according to provision C above, the total dollar value of the contract includes all the option years. The second provision is also a very practical but often ignored provision. It's not unusual for our provisions to change after a solicitation has been issued. This provision is based on a simple philosophy or legal principle that a deal is a deal. 
when the vendor submits an offer to the government in response to a solicitation, the parties are agreeing that the FAR provision, in effect at the time, applies. Any FAR change can only apply to solicitations issued on or after the effective date of that change, unless the contracting officer wants to give the consideration to change some of those provisions. Go to the next slide, please. Speaking of dollar thresholds, FAR has a lot of them. For example, there's a micro purchase threshold and a simplified acquisition threshold. These thresholds can be raised in two ways. Congress can raise them, and the FAR Council can raise them based on inflation. If you go to betaregulations.gov citation on the slide, you will see that, for example, Congress raised the simplified acquisition threshold from 150,000 to 250,000. But because there had been insufficient inflation between the time that this threshold was raised in 2020, there will be no inflation increase with that threshold now. Uh, cites, um, this provision also cites the uh, DPARS provision cites uh, PGI 21109 for access to those dollar thresholds. But to be honest with you, uh, I couldn't get the whole link to work. So I used the FAR citation that was above. Uh, the next slide, please. Peer reviews. Uh, in 20, uh, 2008 and 2009, Congress uh, issued guidance for peer review process for service acquisitions. Basically, DOD officials are to make independent management reviews of service acquisitions uh, to try and improve the process uh, in the long run. The, the idea is that peer review teams can recommend and identify best practices. And the above describes uh, DOD peer reviews as well as individual component peer reviews. Next slide, please. This is maintenance of FAR. I mentioned earlier that there was a FAR council that basically was in charge of the FAR. This FAR provision identifies the two councils the Defense Acquisition Regulation Council and the Civilian Agency Acquisition Council. The same FAR provision uh, describes in greater detail the DAR Council and what it does. Its members are representative of military departments. And notice also that DLA, Defense Logistics Agency, and DC are included. This particular subsection 1C of FAR is supplemented by this other section of, FAR, of uh, DFARS, which addresses the composition and the operation of the DAR Council. Next slide, please. Uh, this one's sort of obvious. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. The Secretary of uh, DOD is responsible for his department's compliance with FAR. Uh, next slide, please. This FAR provision addresses how agency regulations like DFARS are to be carried out. First of all, the agency head issues the regulation and those regulations must implement or supplement FAR, nothing else. The proposed regulations that we'll get to this a little later are published for federal, uh, in the federal register for public comment. Uh, and also, notice also the distinction between implement and supplement. There really is a difference. We see this difference in DFARS 201-301 policy. That provision describes what DFARS contains, requirements, law, DOD-wide policies, etc. Everything else goes in PGI. Next slide, please. This slide describes what implement and supplement mean. Um, supplement uh, includes uh, contract clauses that have to satisfy specific needs of the agencies, while implement means how is the agency going to be carrying out uh, the, uh, the FAR provisions. Uh, and this is just another uh, example of how strictly FAR wants to limit what the agencies put in their own regulations. You're going to see there's really a policy in restricting 
and making sure that their uh, that agency regulations don't get larded down with, with more uh, regulations. Uh, next slide, please. This FAR provision requires agency regulations to follow the FAR style. Uh, it's interesting to see that DFARS wants the numbering to focus on implementable, leaving supplemental numbering, which is the number 70. Only when the text can't be integrated intelligibly, it says, within its FAR counterpart. We have a few slides that will show this later. Uh, next slide, please. This is a good example uh, based on DFARS of how the numbering goes, both for implementing provisions as well as supplementing provisions, uh, the, uh, the numbers, uh, the clauses that end with uh, 7-0, as we'll see. Next slide, please. These are peer reviews. Um, the next slide is a good example of a supplemental provision. Um, it, it describes, uh, it, it's really 201.170, okay, so we're getting into the seven zeros here. It describes the DOD peer review process, which is designed to provide for independent management reviews of service acquisitions, which I mentioned before. Uh, next slide, please. This FAR provision, again, emphasizes that agencies are not supposed to include in their acquisition regu regulation, their own agency uh, regulation, um, unnecessary um, language that uh, paraphrase or otherwise restate FAR DFARS material. Um, and it does allow for deviations, which we'll get into in later slides. The DFARS makes the undersecretary approval required for significant provisions. We'll get into that. Next slide, please. Deviations. One of the overriding principles of government regulations, it seems, at least for procurement, uh, is that the government never writes regulations so restrictive or so tight that the government's prevented from doing exactly what it has to do. Routinely, a procurement regulation will have exceptions. So this brings us to the deviations. First of all, FAR allows deviation. So the question then becomes, what exactly can qualify as a deviation? Here, FAR describes what a deviation can be. Something inconsistent with FAR, something leaving out required clauses, uh, something using modified language that's not authorized by FAR. Uh, something that's substantially like but inconsistent with it, uh, using lesser or greater limitations on the use of the solicitation provisions, uh, and using something not incorporated into agency regs by federal register publication. Uh, a great example of a DFARS deviation is one adopted several years ago by DOD that gave unsuccessful offerors enhanced post-award debriefing rights. Uh, specifically, uh, the existing FAR provision required the agency to give certain information to unsuccessful offerors on why they lost a procurement. The deviation that DOD issued expanded these debriefing rights by allowing unsuccessful vendors a chance to submit additional questions within two days after the debriefing. The agency then had to respond in writing to the additional questions within five days. These DFARS provisions go well beyond what FAR allows for a post-award debriefing. The uh, next slide, please. This FAR provision is consistent with the power provision I mentioned earlier that encourages agencies and contracting officers to be innovative. It comes right out and makes clear that if a deviation is required, it shouldn't deter agencies from developing new acquisition methods. So it, it's certainly consistent with the previous uh, innovation policy in FAR. The DFARS provision 
implements the fire policy by identifying the DOD positions in charge of approving deviations. Notice that the provision refers to individual or class deviations. The next slide describes what these are. And next slide, please. According to FAR, an individual deviation affects only one contract action. It can be authorized by the HC head and requires a contracting officer to do a justification and approval called a JNA in the file. Uh, any deviation involving previous or executive agreements involve a little bit more uh, red tape, I'll avoid. DFARs here, individual deviations other than those that must go way up to the top, like those described in the previous slide, can be approved at lower levels, depending on the department and the agency. It's interesting to know that contracting officers outside the U.S. have more flexibility, which just makes sense. When approving contracts for support services with NATO and the UN, particularly when those organizations won't agree to standard FAR clauses, it makes sense. Next slide, please. This FAR provision is interesting, I think, because uh, it allows uh, DOD class deviations to be controlled and approved in accordance with DFARS. Um, so FAR cuts uh, DFARS an awful lot of slack right on the face of the FAR provision. Uh, DFARS picks up the ball too, uh, making class deviation approval authority go way up to the top but it allows senior procurement executives to approve class deviations that are insignificant. The enhanced debriefing deviation I mentioned earlier uh, was a class deviation. Uh, next slide, please. FAR makes it easy to have deviations when you're dealing with trees and executive agreements, and that makes sense. Uh, these agreements are government to government agreements or government to international organizations uh, that require flexibility. The general rule in subsection B and C is that deviations from FAR that are required to comply with either a treaty or executive agreement are authorized. With a treaty, the exception is that if the deviation would be inconsistent with FAR based on a law passed by Congress after the execution of the treaty, in other words, if Congress has spoken, no deviation. Deviations from executive agreements are okay, as long as the deviation won't be inconsistent with FAR based on the law, regardless of when the law was passed, before or after the execution of the executive agreement. Next slide, please. This section is very important because it deals with transparency. The general rule is that important regulations affecting the public have to involve notice to the public and input from the public. I've broken FAR 1501 down into several subparts. First of all, the definition of significant revisions. Those are revisions that alter something in the FAR system that have a significant cost or administrative impact on contractors or on the agency but it excludes you know, nickel dime editorial stylistic changes that have no impact on the basic meaning. Next slide, please. This provision establishes the policy that the views of agencies and non-government parties will be considered in making acquisition policy. So that policy, as I mentioned, involves federal register notice to the public uh, that the agency plans to do something and allowing 30 or 60 days for the public to comment on it. I'm, I'm sure people submitting comments on proposed changes wonder whether anybody is really reading them. My experience from FAR and from reading SBA revised regulations is that, at least in procurement, the views of people making comments are taken very seriously. Uh, it's gratifying when you read the comments to see that agencies have changed parts of the regulations based on public comments. And without being naive, it's nice to see that agencies do in fact consider and value the time and effort people put into making uh, public comments. Next slide, please. 
there are just two exceptions here to publications and they make sense. Regulations that are not revisions, right? you know, why they're restating language that doesn't need to be out for public comment. And then the other one that's always around urgent and compelling circumstances. Uh, next slide, please. The next part I think is really important uh, because it deals with the career development of contracting officers and contracting officers representatives or CORs, uh, as, as well as those who have contracting authorities in the government. Uh, including DOD and then and, and also it says uh, what their responsibilities are. So I've broken these provisions down in greater detail um, than, than some of the previous regulations. This slide makes the obvious point that contracting authority and responsibility are in the, uh, the, the head of the agency. Typically the agency head establishes contracting activities and delegates authorities to the heads of various contract activities. Notice though that contracts may be entered into and signed on behalf of the government only by contracting officers. Also, there are a relative small number of public officials are basically contracting officers because they're the head of the agency uh, or, or else they're high up in the agency. Uh, and then also finally, contracting officers below the head, the level of the head of contracting activity um, will be selected and appointed under FAR 1603, which we'll uh, discuss shortly. Next slide, please. This provision allows cooperation and allows agencies head, agency heads to uh, coordinate functions uh, from one agency to another. Next slide, please. This next slide makes a good distinction because it gives contracting officers authority to make contracts, but only to the extent of the authority delegated to them. Depending on the agencies, I found that some contracting officers have unlimited authority uh, in terms of dollar value. Other contracting officers will have authority up to a specified dollar level. The according authority has to give them written instructions regarding the limits of their authority. And those limits are to be available to the general public to see so they can check out. So when a potential vendor wants to know what authority the contracting officer has, there's supposed to be something in writing that specifies and is in public what the limits of that particular contracting officer's authority is. As you can see, there's, there's no DFARS provision expanding that one. Next slide, please. With this, um, this provision, this provision is, it's almost impossible to comply with this provision. Um, contract, uh, contracting officers are supposed to make sure that all requirements of law, executive order, regulations, and all their other applicable procedures have been met. That's impossible. Regardless, they're, they're supposed to be ready to do that, but obviously it's a very difficult job to do. Uh, next slide, please. R16022 responsibilities contain so much information but I want to spread it over five slides. This FAR provision describes both the job of the contracting officer and the job of the contracting officer's representative or COR. Uh, DFARS, as we're going to see, doesn't add anything about the contracting officer's job, but it does talk about the duties of the COR, and I'll discuss those in the following slides. Like the previous FAR clause describing the contracting officer's authority, this FAR clause describes the contracting officer's responsibility. It gives the contracting officer another impossible job. They're supposed to ensure performance of all necessary actions for effective contracting, ensuring compliance with the terms of the contract and safeguarding the interests of the United States and its contractual relationships. They're also supposed to have a wide latitude in exercising business judgments. 
Go to the next slide, please. FAR 16022 then breaks down the contracting officer's responsibilities into four areas. First, under uh, Section A, the contracting officer is to ensure that all the laws have been met and there's enough money available for the obligation. Under B, contractors must receive impartial, fair, and equitable treatment. I'll get back to this one. Under C, the contracting officer is supposed to get help and advice from other agency specialists, which certainly makes sense. Getting back uh, to um, paragraph B for a minute, uh, the contracting officer's duty to make sure that contractors receive impartial, fair, and equitable treatment. This, too, seems like a very vague, unenforceable statement of how a contractor should be treated. But it's more than that. Legally, courts have used this provision to find the government liable for damages because a contracting officer officer was treating a contractor unfairly. It covers only the most egregious situations of unfair treatment for contractors, but it's a FAR provision that contractors can enforce against the government and end up getting an equitable adjustment from the government based on this very, very vague statement that they didn't receive impartial, fair, and equitable treatment. Uh, next slide, please. Subparagraph D deals with the responsibilities of CORs. It makes the contracting officer responsible for selecting CORs for many types of government contracts and orders. It also allows the contracting officer to be the COR, which we've seen on some small uh, projects. Next slide, please. This slide begins to describe the seven responsibilities of a COR's job in greater detail. This slide describes four of them. Generally, a COR must be a government employee. In addition, a COR must be certified and maintain that certification. They must be qualified by training and experience to do their job. And fourth, they're not supposed to be given contract administration work that's already been delegated out. But depending on uh, whether uh, the contracting officer wants to, uh, they're allowed by FAR 42302 to be assigned by the contracting officer to one of the 71 different jobs that FAR considers contract administration functions. We have the next slide, please. This slide continues to describe the seven responsibilities or aspects of a COR's job. Number five is probably one of the most important. CORs have no authority to commit the government to anything. Price changes, quality, quantity, delivery terms, conditions of the contract, to tell the contractor subs how to operate. This is probably one of the most litigated aspects of a COR's job. Contractor claims that it was required to make changes to the work not by the contracting officer, but by the COR. Number five makes it clear that a contractor, that a COR cannot change a contract. But regardless of what FAR says, there are plenty of cases where the government has paid for the unauthorized commitments of a COR, which we'll be discussing shortly. Next slide, please. On this slide, FAR describes the paperwork required to properly establish a government employee as a COR. Notice seven Roman numeral five, V. A COR's appointment must state that the COR may be personally financially liable for unauthorized acts. This warning is a good reminder to a COR because any change to the contract directed by the COR 
that doesn't have the contracting officer's approval exposes the COR to personal financial liability. This is a very serious provision and it's worth being warned about. Next slide, please. The next two slides deal with what DFARS adds. Uh, of these critical FAR provisions, DFARS adds nothing about a contracting office responsibilities. But DFARS does address the CORs. DFARS requires the COR to be a government employee and forbids the COR from being a contractor employee. Next slide, please. DFARS also requires that this clause, 272-201-7000, be included in solicitations and contracts that are expected to have a COR. Um, let's take a look at this clause. The next slide, please. This is the specific wording used for this clause. It's a wonderful clause to include in a solicitation and a contract because it expressly warns contractors that there will be a COR and that it's in the contractor's interest to get a copy of the COR designation. So describe the COR's authority and warns that CORs can't make any changes to the contract terms. Next slide, please. Another critical FAR clause that probably needs uh, no addition from DFARS uh, is this one, ratification. It makes sense to include ratification provisions following provisions on the COR because ratifications allow the government to approve unauthorized commitments of government employees, including CORs. In paragraph A, a ratification is defined as the approval of an, basically retroactive approval, of an unauthorized commitment by an official who has the authority to prove the unauthorized act. What this process addresses is a situation where, for better or for worse, changes get made to a contract that have not been formally approved by the contracting officer. <clears throat> Excuse me. Legally, the government's got no obligation to pay for unauthorized commitments, that's clear. But what if the unauthorized commitment gave the government a real benefit? I mean, suppose a COR or a contracting officer got a contract and gave them something extra under a contract, like a, uh, a longer paved road. The court decisions say that even though the contractor did something that was not authorized by the contract, the government benefited from the unauthorized act. So it's simply fair to have the government retroactively approve and pay for the unauthorized act. So a head of contract activity could ratify a COR decision or an unauthorized act of the contracting officer. We have a, the next slide, please. This FAR provision describes the policy on unauthorized commitments. Obviously, agencies should try to preclude them from happening in the first place. And that the head of contracting activity can ratify an unauthorized commitment. The same FAR provision describes alternative ways of handling unauthorized commitments, but they are very visible and very embarrassing to agencies. These methods include going to the Government Accountability Office, GAO for resolution, or processing unauthorized commitments under the disputes clause and giving a contractor an equitable adjustment. Next slide, please. This provision describes the limitations uh, on uh, ratifications. The government must get a benefit. The ratifying official must have the authority. The price is fair and reasonable. Money is available, et cetera. Next provision, please. This is probably the worst alternative and the most visible. 
If an unauthorized commitment doesn't get paid by the agency, a contractor can go to GAO and affect throw itself on the mercy of GAO and try to get paid. Next provision, please. The next six slides, I think, are very important to the government employees because they address the career development of contracting personnel. The first slide describes the basics that the agency must have. It must have a procurement career management program and a system for selecting, appointing, and terminating, unfortunately, the appointment of contracting officers. Next slide, please. This slide describes the criteria that agencies must use in selecting contracting officers. Specifically, agencies, quote, must consider the complexity and dollar value of the acquisitions and the candidate's background, experience, training, education, judgment, and reputation. FAR goes on to give some examples of selection criteria, including experience, education, knowledge of acquisition policies, specialized knowledge in particular fields, for example, like IT, uh, and completing acquisition training courses. Next slide, please. This slide, we get to the first of two slides giving DFAR's guidance on contracting officer qualifications. On the first slide, DFARS points out that federal law requires a contracting officer above the simplified acquisition level to have completed all required contracting courses, have at least two years experience in a contract position, probably as a contract specialist, have a baccalaureate or bachelor's degree from an accredited educational institution, and meet additional requirements that the Secretary of Defense would establish. Notice number three, that waivers are available. Uh, next slide, please. On the second slide, the DFARS provision provides three exceptions to the bachelor degrees requirement, including grandfathering in those who were at a certain contracting level as of September 30, uh, 2000. Next slide, please. This slide describes the contracting officer's appointment paperwork. This file provision says that appointments can be made using SF-1402, which is the standard certificate of appointment. Micro-purchase authority you know, uh, could, should be done in the hands of the, uh, of the users in writing. Um, FAR gives DOD uh, civilian and members of the armed forces some purchase authority to use the government-wide purchase card that exceeds the micro-purchase threshold but doesn't exceed 25000 under certain kinds of circumstances. Next slide, please. This FAR provision addresses termination of the contracting officer's appointment, which is supposed to be by a letter unless a certificate of appointment allows automatic termination, perhaps after a number of years. But notice, no termination shall operate retroactively. If it did operate retroactively, things that a contracting officer had done legally might become unauthorized and illegal. Next slide, please. This is another Dash 70 provision. Uh, it's the appointment of property administrators and plant clearance authorities. Next slide, please. I've included provisions on determinations and findings because they are so common in procurement in general. Uh, for example, uh, an agency must do a DNF when it wants to do something that should be very transparent. For example, there's a huge loophole, if you will, for a sole source procurement if it is based on the public interest, according to FAR 6302-7. Anything supposedly done in the public interest can be so broad, though, that it's open, as we say, to mischief by the agency. To put some limits on 
potential abuse of sole source based on public interest far requires that a determination and finding DNF of what that specific public interest is be expressed. And in this instance, it must be made way up at the top by the Secretary of Defense for DOD procurements. Um, I should add right now that the DFARS has no provisions dealing with the DNFs. This slide describes what a DNF is. It's basically a written approval required by statute or regulation as a prerequisite to taking certain contracts action. That the determination is the decision and findings are basically the rationale as to why an official wants to act the way the DNF states. We have the next provision. Uh, next slide, please. DNFs are typically done early uh, in the solicitation process. Uh, uh, so, for example, one that would authorize the sole source of procurements, as I mentioned. Notice it allows reasonable variations in quantities. Next slide, please. There are class deviations and findings. Uh, the, um, I've tried to find situations where there have been uh, de determinations made this way, and I frankly, I can't find any cases on this either. Um, this is a provision, I'm sorry, the next slide, please. <clears throat> this provision calls for what the contents of a DNF is supposed to include. Again, I can't find any cases that give you a good uh, explanation of more information of what's being provided. Um, but uh, the, uh, the beauty of this nice laundry list uh, is that when a contracting officer or agency official has to do a DNF, FAR really describes in good detail exactly what's supposed to be included in the DNF. And that's, I think, is, is very helpful. Um, that concludes my presentation, um, probably a little early, but uh, I didn't want to add anything more to this. So I just uh, thank you for uh, your attention. If there's uh, questions you have for me, uh, please feel free to uh, you know, send them to me, uh, send me an email, I'll be happy to, to talk to you about it. Um, and uh, I, I encourage you to uh, follow uh, the uh, whole series here that uh, Jay Schaus and Associates is, put, is putting on, it's finally digging into, uh, finally someone is digging into uh, all the fine points of these regulations, and that's very important, I think. Uh, again, thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Terry, for a great presentation and sharing your time with us today. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined us. And the recording will be on our website and YouTube channel within the next 24 hours. Um, please join us next Wednesday as we cover more of the DFARS um, in our webinar series. Um, and check out the Q&A Cafe um, this Friday and um, every second Friday of every month this year. Thank you.